Welcome to Municipal Affairs, the show dedicated to delving deep into the matters that shape municipalities across Canada. Now, as we bid farewell to 2023, we're taking stock of the highs and lows, the triumphs and trials that have shaped our municipalities from across Canada. Today, we are honored to be sitting down with the president of the Rural Municipalities of Alberta, Reeve Paul McLaughlin. From navigating unprecedented circumstances to celebrating noteworthy achievements, our municipalities have been on the forefront of change over the last 12 months. So stay with us as this is Municipal Affairs Year in Review. Paul, I want to thank you so much for coming on and talking about the last 12 months in uh, Alberta and particularly with the role of uh, rural municipalities of Alberta. I want to start by a general question, but it's an important question. And that is at the end of 2023, what do you believe is the state of rural municipalities in the province of Alberta today? You know, I think that we've, you know, I'll start with a sandwich, you know, two pieces of bread, the meat in the middle, the negative part will be the the meat in the sandwich and the bread will be the positive things. And, you know, it it almost sounds cliche at this stage, but I do feel like we're being heard by this government. I think that the core issues that we've been talking about uh, related to uh, food security, agriculture, uh, some of the rural issues that we're dealing with, whether it's affordability and and other issues tied to the day to day business of rural municipalities, um, I think we've been we feel that we've been heard. Um, I think we have some overarching issues as it relates to funding, core funding of infrastructure. Uh, we're responsible for seventy five percent of the roads, sixty percent of the bridges. Um, I represent fifteen percent of the population that contributes to twenty six percent of the GDP and 41% of the capital investments in rural Alberta. So recognizing that the infrastructure we're responsible for and ensuring we have a funding model that makes sense, I think is critical. But I do think the core issues uh, related to healthcare, um, policing, um, some of those issues, at least this government is moving forward and acting and not just talking. And I think that um, the proof is always going to be in the pudding, but uh, we do feel that we're being heard um, by the Smith government. Uh, our access to ministers um, and keep keep pe- people within government has been exceptional. And uh, we're part of the part of the uh, solution. So I think that, you know, for the most part, I think 2023 for rural Alberta has been uh, fairly favorable. And I think we'll continue on that path. I want to talk about some of the major uh, sort of news stories that happened in the last uh, 12 months uh, before we talk about sort of looking forward in 2024 and what you have been storing for RMA. I want to go back to March of this year, if if you don't mind. And I want to talk about the unpaid oil and gas uh, property taxes that rural municipalities were owed by derelict oil and gas companies. Can you give me an update on sort of where this stands at the end of 2023? Because we're about to go into a lot of municipalities are in budget season right now and are they getting their money have they even started to get their money because i know energy minister then energy minister pete guthrie called on the derelict companies to start paying as of april 30th but nothing really came from it from the news perspective so what's an update on this story yeah and and for sure chris we are collecting information we it won't be available till february so i all i can give you is is anecdotal and we have seen a marginal increase in 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 uh, folks getting paid, and we have seen definitely an uptake in that. Um, the fundamental problem with the with the uh, ministerial order that came through is that you need to be an active oil and gas company that is drilling, or running more pipelines. So that was the trigger point. If you are a zombie company that's just kind of coasting and producing, uh, there's really no no way to force those companies to pay their taxes. And so, uh, you know, as of late, a few companies have, have had their pin pulled by uh, AER. You know, we kind of stick back to our original foundational solution to the problem is that, that uh, where it says may or shall uh, that you should have your municipal taxes paid in order to operate an oil and gas facility in the province of Alberta, and by extension, um, surface payments as well to to rural Albertans. And so, uh, those two core pieces are foundational to uh, the ability to operate in this province, and we'll continue that message. Um, I, I expect that that minister order, I think, definitely was a shot across the bow. Whether it resolved the problem, um, I would say that it probably has marginally. Um, has it eliminated the problem completely? I, I don't think it has. And I think that we want to play the long game and work with the government to ensure that uh, this becomes a requirement to operate in the province of Alberta. 
are you hearing anything from the Minister of Energy, Brian Jean, about this issue right now? Or because I know the AER is a separate entity, it's an arm length ent entity, but they do have control over the AER. Are you hearing anything from this government to give you some positive news that this long game is not going to continuously be a long game, but there's an end to the long game? Yeah, we'll be meeting with the ministry in the new year. And actually, that's already been lined up to have this very conversation uh, <laughs> as a path forward. Um, I always uh, provided a courtesy that this information will be our, our, our summary information will be provided to the ministry prior to the release to the general public. Um, and I think that uh, we'll continue that message. I think that, you know, the key thing that we need to deal with is the fact that in order for this to be addressed, we need to make legislative changes. And that's never easy. Um, it would be a fundamental shift, but I think that uh, we need to move forward on that path. Um, I think that the, this government has never argued that someone should pay their taxes. Um, and, and I think that this is really number nine item on a list of 10 items for operating oil and gas facility in the province. Uh, it is not foundational to these companies running um, where they're using tax money as short-term you know, interest-free credit. And uh, we'll continue to echo that message. This is for the health of the industry. The 96% of the industry that pays their taxes is just, a, just as offended by this as the folks I represent too as well. While we're talking about the energy industry, I want to talk about the renewable pause that the minister, the uh, government sort of announced earlier on in the spring, if not late spring, early summer, right after they were reelected. Um, they they said that the RMA members were potentially advocating for this during the uniquely rural. Uh, you came out and said, well, actually not you, but Vulcan County Reeve came out and said, yes, they were in support of this pause to sort of line up to figure out where their property taxes are going to be going. Um are you hearing anything from this government? Because it's a six-month pause that's coming up in 2024. Uh, have you heard anything from this government? And also, I want to make sure I got the acronym right here because there's too many acronyms to remember here. But are, have you heard anything from the AUC as well along this pause and what we are potentially going to see in February of next year? Yeah, we, we've been very active on this file, Chris. So uh, the, the Alberta Utilities Commission uh, has had public outreach. Uh, we provided evidence um, and we've actually, working with the Canadian Renewable Energy Association, actually uh, requested a couple of studies, one tied to uh, reclamation restoration, the other tied to use of agricultural land. Um, so we're provide, I'm providing oral evidence this Thursday, actually, to the AUC hearing. Um, and so, yeah, we've definitely been involved. Uh, we're obviously a, a key uh, key stakeholder in this discussion. Um, and I think the two fundamental pieces that we, we've had, really the three pieces, was preservation of agricultural land, specifically irrigated lands, was a key issue. But also having the public interest test as it relates to food security and land use was critical. Recognizing municipal land use authority is important. Uh, we are, uh, of, of all the things that we may not be expert at, um, we are experts in land use in our own municipalities. We have the statutory authority. Um, and in many ways, we've been ignored from the decision-making process, so at least we're part of the process. And then, then the final piece is the restoration and reclamation piece. Um, I think that uh, I'm actually starting to become more and more confident based upon the evidence that I've seen that um, we will create more certainty for the industry more certainty for landowners and more certainty for municipalities. And uh, this is a tremendous opportunity for both the landowner as well as municipalities from a taxation or, or revenue standpoint, but we want to do it right. And going back to your first question about oil and gas, we've learned uh, how if you don't have those pieces in place, uh, there is no uh, restoration or reclamation requirement because of the nature of these projects. So um, people could walk away from them. I have uh, talked to people with uh, solar installations on their land that are on their fifth company in two years. So these are changing hands quite quickly uh, from one company to another. Typically, they're numbered companies that have a parent. Um, this follows the model of what we've seen in, in abandoned and, and uh, orphan wells in the history. And I know people um, don't want to connect the two. But land use is land use. And I think that we've learned from whether gravel pits or oil and gas that the cheapest form of reclamation is bankruptcy. We've seen it time and time again. Um, and in the situation of many of these, Chris, um, Sally and Joe had someone approach them and put a solar installation that could be game changing. This could allow you to keep the farm going. Multi-generational transfer can allow you to buy that equipment to farm the rest of your land. It's a tremendous opportunity. But fast forward 10 or 12 years, if you're on your fifth company that's owned by whoever um, and they decide not to pay the municipal taxes, um, then Sally and Joe are responsible for the municipal taxes. And in that case, if they don't have the taxes, 
um, that land eventually ultimately would be um, seized, for lack of a better term, by a municipality and actually sold to recoup those taxes. We would be, end up owning solar plants all over all the province. It's a very real possibility. Um, it's something that could happen, and I think it's it's important to recognize. And and I think that uh, I know this is really, really an exciting opportunity for, for Alberta. I think in what the government has done, we've supported it in as much as we need to do this right, because it's a tremendous opportunity. I think that we need to take advantage of it, but we also need to think play the long game and recognize that food security is an important part of the conversation that we should have as well in a climate change world. And well, I think that you cannot separate renewables from, from food security as part of the greater conversation on public interest. You you have mentioned it a few times, so I'm going to play in that sandbox for a little bit, if you don't mind, and that is food security. Um, one, one of the big things that comes with food security is taxes. And one of the biggest uh, contributors to uh, a lot of uh, insecurities around farmers who produce our food is the carbon tax. And I, I'm not speaking out of turn there. You are seeing it firsthand as a rancher yourself, and you are hearing it probably from across your county and also from your members. Um, you were just in the uh, Ottawa recently in November for Advocacy Days for FCM. I'm assuming this was brought up, and if it wasn't, I would have to ask why, but I'm assuming it was brought up what did you hear from the government and from the opposition around the carbon tax and bill i want to make sure i get this right i think it's two three four or one two three one of the mistaken about yeah, sort of two, removing two, carbon taxes from farmers yeah and, and and definitely was definitely part of the conversation chris and i think that we we need to recognize two parts of this this conversation is the affordability conversation um and and then also that we are in a global marketplace. And so our agricultural goods, we're an ex agricultural export, a net agricultural exporter. And so we're competing with other jurisdictions that do not have carbon tax. So having our commodity being impacted by carbon tax, it's a big conversation related to trade. And it's not recognizing that that uh, what the ar argument always is, is someone's more special and then someone becomes more special. So heating oil out in the east, that's a special situation. We're not going to have a carve out. As soon as a carve out was created, <clears throat> the whole logic really got destroyed on really what the whole intent of it was. And I think that we need to recognize that that this is counter to to our ability to feed ourselves. Uh, it, it's a fundamental issue as it relates to export and trade. Uh, we're being approached, Alberta specifically, we're being approached by Japan, China, um, Europe to increase our agricultural production to feed the world. Uh, we have an incredible agricultural sector um, and carbon tax that's tied to it um, can become detrimental to that price point that the, uh, the, the external uh, markets require. So I think we need to have this conversation. I think that uh, probably the biggest political mistake that the the liberals had made was was to carve this out. I think that we could have actually, uh, in their situation, they easily could have created a rebate program or whatever they did, and instead they made the mistake of of giving three years waiving of the carbon tax. Um, and I think that we need to recognize that uh, this is foundational to rural Alberta. Um, I think that we need to have this conversation, but I think incentives is what the Americans are using as it relates to fighting climate change. Incentives, I think, is the winning model. Uh, it's working in the United States. It's actually caused stimulus to their economy. And I think that the government needs to recognize that the carbon tax, the way it was uh, designed, uh, has been a failed policy piece, and they need to move on from it and rejig it and come up with something that will be more foundational to uh, more productive ways to address the situation. So. I I will be the first to admit I I, I had be prior to 2023 I had not looked at my uh, my power bill to see how much I was paying each month in carbon tax but I'm assuming as uh, members across the rural uh, Alberta they have probably been seeing that every month every time they pay their power bill do you mind me asking and I'm going to put it on the spot here Paul but how much are you paying each month for the carbon tax just in your own community right now do you know sort of a rough estimate because I just want to make sure that my listeners understand that what you're paying in the cities is not what you're paying out in uh, uh, rural Alberta. Yeah, and without I, I got to think what the numbers are. You got me on the spot here. I can pull up my power <laughs> bill, but the uh, but I, but I, we actually undertook a study just recently, Chris. So I think it's re it's very nuanced. So recognizing that. Um, I, I, in rural Alberta, I consume a lot more power than, than the average house does. I've got stock waters and well pumps, and I've got lots of stuff on the go. <laughs> I pay for my own, my own sewer pump. 
<laughs> I have many pieces I use. I definitely consume a lot more power. Um, now, that being said, I also have solar and wind. So uh, I actually, in my office that I'm speaking, I'm speaking to you on solar right now, Chris. So, um, so I do generate my own power. Um, but I think that what we need to recognize is it's it's the although the net comes back, um, this is if you add the impact of carbon tax on inflation, on um, right now the cost of money, um, this has become additive and it's started to become counterproductive to to rural production of of, of food, and so I think that uh, we we even have an economic study that says it's quite marginal increase. But if you actually add that marginal increase to all the other increases, which includes the price of power, um, we're all feeling that. We're feeling that. And I think that um, it's going to be a leaner Christmas for all of us. But I mean, going beyond that, just from a consumer standpoint, um, we need to recognize that we need to be able to feed ourselves. And in our priorities of things that we need to do, we need to make sure that we've got the necessary pieces in place to support our agricultural industry to not just feed us, but to feed the world. This is a critical part of our economy. We need to recognize it. And at the same time, that does not even come close to stating that we should not fight climate change or we shouldn't reduce emissions. Just that this model has not worked because I don't have necessarily choice. The whole idea behind carbon tax was I would change my choices and my choices would be further energy efficiency, et cetera. But I run out of choices when I live in a cold climate <laughs> that I cannot use a heat pump where I live in Alberta because lo and behold, as you know, Chris, uh, heat pumps will not work in minus 25. And at the same time, my ability to heat uh, a barn or to, to you know heat a livestock facility using some of that technology is rather limited. So we need to recognize it that, that that's the situation we're in. Uh, we can act accordingly and we can increase the use of renewables and look for more efficiencies in the system. But it is starting to become a bit of an issue. Um, the, the, the impact on agriculture is such that you're starting to see a lot less cattle production than we've seen in the past. And that's tied to relationships to drought, but also cost of inputs. And we need to start recognizing those cost of inputs are actually reducing our ability to feed ourselves. And that's an important conversation we all need to have. Um, I, I'm cautious of time here, and I want to talk about the sort of the big thing that sort of took place over this last 12 months, and that was uh, RMAs and Alberta municipalities call for the provincial government to give more funding for infrastructure. You've just openly said in the beginning of our interview, 75% of the roads and 60% of the bridges are maintained by rural municipalities. Now, uh, we're at the end of the year, and unless uh, something happens between now and next Tuesday when this airs, uh, I'm assuming Minister McIver is not not going to come to the table with an extra billion dollars in funding for municipalities and rural municipalities. That being said, budgets are being done. Cost of living is going up. Affordability is going up. Inflation is up through the roof. And that means more and more infrastructure projects are being sort of left on the table or even pushed till next year to potentially see if there's going to be more money at the table. Looking back on the last 12 months and looking forward in 2024, how do we solve this issue? Because the roads and bridges are still going to be need to be fixed if we don't do it today. Yeah, no, exactly, Chris. So, you know, as I said, this government's been hearing us, um, and that's maybe the thing they haven't necessarily heard enough of. <laughs> and so we're pushing forward. Really, there is a need to recognizing that, that critical infrastructure um, needs needs to have, we need to have some help. I we as rural municipal leaders, my municipality has 170 bridges. Those bridges are worth a million dollars a piece. I have a $170 million bridge liability. I have $40 million in reserves. Um, there is some timing tied to a lot of these, these bridges. A lot of them were built at the exact same time. So they're going to age out at the exact same time. I can use binder twine and duct tape to keep these bridges going. But recognizing that we need a certain level of help uh, to allow us to keep this infrastructure going because it does drive our economy. And the taxes that we get from oil and gas, the taxes we get from, from our, our rural taxpayers, these are important parts of the puzzle, but we do need assistance. And so this deficit, um, Albertans will start to feel uh, this pressure on municipal funding um, quite readily. And as you know, through channels through FCM, uh, we only have access to 10, 10 cents on the dollar for every tax dollar. But at the same time, we have these tremendous responsibilities um, and responsibilities that we do an amazing job at. Uh, I represent the most fiscally prudent people you could ever imagine. Uh, rest assured that these folks, that they have, they're tight-fisted and they get things done the right way. But at the same time, 
uh, we do need a certain level of assistance because we don't have access to those dollars. 15% uh, of the population in the province contributes 26% to the GDP, but some of that GDP does not flow back in the form of, of grants and otherwise. And so we need to continue that message. We're going to continue that message. Uh, and we're going to look for ways to work with this government to find, find a, a successful way. Um, a billion dollar liability municipalities, Albertans will start to feel that if they haven't already. I'm going to ask sort of the stupid question here, Paul, but I think I have to. What happens if they don't? What if the province, the federal government don't come to the table? We we talk about the, the province and the federal government need to come to the table to help solve an issue. But let's be honest, they take forever from time to time to come to the table to sort these issues out. Until then, you're sort of left holding the bag. What happens if they don't come to the table in 2024? Is it all hands on deck and you're going to have to try and figure this out yourself or are these bridges going to have to be taken out of commission here? Yeah, well, I mean, we'll start looking at at uh, asset closure. We'll start looking at uh, at, at ways to basically your the assets, municipal assets will start to degrade. Uh, the net value of assets will degrade, but the service to Albertans will degrade, and our ability to actually dr drive the economy will start to be impacted by the de degradation of service. Uh, you're going to see a degradation of service as well as of assets. Um, we're doing the best we can with what we've got recognizing that we don't have the control over all the dollars. And I'll tell you that those 10% on every dollar of taxation that you spend, you feel it every single day. You'll feel it as you walk out your door today, um, as you walk on the sidewalks or you drive down the roads. And I think that recognizing the importance of those assets and the quality of life Albertans, I think is critical. So we will continue to, to bang the drum. Uh, working with our partners at AB Munis, we'll continue to get that message out. As Albertans start to feel that lack of investment, uh, we know who to point the fingers at. And I think that this government needs to find ways to address this issue. Um, and the big scheme of things, a uh, billion dollars to to drive this economy doesn't seem like a lot of money. It, uh, it It's about the same value of an XL pipeline that was invested by this government uh, four years ago. So um, it's not that much different than those type of investments. Uh, you'd get a tremendous bang for your buck by adding a billion dollars to municipal funding. And I think that uh, all Albertans would would prosper by that. And I think they'd be in favor of it. I want to turn our sights to 2024 now. Uh, RMA, I want to start there. What's in store for the organization in 2024? Is it steady as she goes, trying to advocate for its members? Or is there anything on the horizon that we can look forward to and sort of uh, put a mark on the calendar to say, let's chat in 2024, Paul? Well, you know, a third of the province right now is in a one, one in 50 year subsoil drought. Um, uh, and the other third of the province in the forested areas is looking at below normal precipitation for this year. Uh, we are set up to have probably a generational, if not twice in a generation, uh, probably about a 50 year drought in Southern Alberta, which will, will be significant. If we don't get the snowpack or some sort of snowmageddon event anytime soon, uh, the ability to recharge uh, the water systems in southern Alberta uh, all the way up to Calgary is, is been hampered significantly. And so water is going to be a huge issue. Uh, at the same time, we had uh, the largest fires in Alberta history. 4.6% uh, of our forests are burned. There's 73 fires still going right now. Um, we could be walking into just as equally as frightening fire situations as we did last year. So we are talking about what did we learn? How can we do things better? How can we make land use choices that can preserve water or, or take away the risk of, of fires? And uh, how can we work with this government to do so? So those are two key things that we have moving forward. Uh, we also just released a report on quasi-judicial boards, how they work with municipalities. So conversations of the AR, the AUC and the NRCB, how they respect municipal planning authority in their decision model is critical. And I think our new target is going to be the LPRT, which was an amalgam of multiple boards into one that we're not finding that they're actually making decisions that are in the public interest and aren't necessarily, again, following uh, the good governance goal that we have as municipalities and not recognizing uh, really how you build quality decisions at the municipal level. So I think our, our next conversation in the coming year is going to be really talking about this LPRT conversation. Uh, I'm having a meeting this afternoon on agri-recovery. So I think that how we support the agricultural industry in uh, this significant drought year and in, in future 
Um, if you look at the models, Chris, uh, this could be our new normal. And if that's our new normal, uh, we need to change how we support our agricultural industry, how we make land use choices, and again, moving forward uh, in the public interest to ensure that we're at least having this public dialogue on how we can move forward in this hotter, drier future that looks like that is emerging in our communities. Can you give me at least a little silver lining there, Paul? Because it seems like you talked a lot about that meat and no, not the two sandwich breads, because you're talking water is going to be an issue in 2024. You're talking wildfire is going to be an issue in 2024. Um, there's got to be some optimism here because those are two big claims that you just made there. And are you hopeful that uh, we are we could be prepared for any situation that happens in 2024? Well, and and so you're right. I'm sounding very depressing, Chris, but I will give you <laughs> I'll give you where the path is. At the same time, we had we had tremendous disasters in our communities. Uh, evacuation. But people took communities in. The good folks of the NWT moved into moved into our communities. Uh, when we evacuated our local communities, we had local heroes everywhere. And I think that if we recognize that our greatest asset is one another and our greatest asset is communities, and by extension, working with those local municipal governments, um, solutions can be found. And although it sounds tremendously dire, um, someone trying to make decisions in a downtown office in one of our capitals is a lot different than someone that's sitting in their community day to day and is able to connect the dots and work with the community. And I've seen nothing but amazingness come out of these small communities when they rallied around one another um, in these tough times. And I think that we need to recognize that, strengthen it, and make sure that that dialogue's open. Um, I think we can solve. None of these problems are, aren't unsolvable. But we need to begin the conversation together. And I've heard great things coming out of this government of already in the new year, we're going to start talking about uh, the drought situation. We're going to start working with this government as it relates to wildfire management and how we can provide the resources and have safer communities. And I think that just recognizing that, you know, municipal government is part of that solution. Um, I see those positive pieces and I've seen it day to day. And I'm very proud of the people I represent because they've all stood up and 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 made sure that their communities are safe and, and have been amazing advocates for these issues too as well. So uh, although I'm sounding doomy and glooming, I think that uh, I represent amazing people and uh, this, hasn't hap this has happened before and we'll get through this and we'll move on stronger and better together for sure. One last question before I let you go here, Paul, and that is for you. What's the one thing you want to be able to check off at the end of 2024? What's the issue that you hope at the end of 2024, if I come back and say, Paul, how'd you do on this issue? What would it be for you and or for the organization? You know, I think that uh, um, I'd probably pick up on the quasi-judicial. So the AUC, the AER, the NRCB and LPRT, recognizing that um, the government that we truly own is local government and recognizing that the good folks I represent, um, they're the voice of their community. They're the best reflection of their community. And, and they make decisions as best they possible with the information they have. Recognizing in the regulatory process the value of our level of municipal government, I think that if I can check that box at the end of 2024 that I move the line, the needle just a little bit, I'll be completely satisfied. Uh, I've seen a tremendous erosion of our, our municipal planning authority. And I think that really it's in the best interest of all Albertans to empower local government, to be given the tools and, and the respect that they deserve to order to at least be part of the decisions. Um, I was asked someone point blank, well, do you want more power and authority? Um, I don't want more power and authority. I want influence. I wanna make sure that we are at least consulted and we're at least part of that dialogue. Um, I don't believe that there needs to be a transfer of authority, but if we're at least listened to, that's half the battle because that's all my rate payers are ever asked for is they want to be heard and they're heard every single, every second and, and, and fourth Tuesday of every month. I have a public open session that anyone can attend. We have and coffee, it's... Chris, <laughs> there's coffee available. It sounds like from the beginning of the conversation to go full circle here, you are sort of being influential in this government with the provincial government. I'm not talking about the federal government here, but the provincial government. It seems like you have a near. Uh, are you hopeful that that will continue in 2024? I, I see every indication that uh, we have some mutual respect. Um, we under, I understand what lane I'm in. And, uh, and I think that they understand what lane they're in and, and we do know that uh, we're stronger together. So to have a successful provincial government, you sure got to have a successful local government too as well.
Paul, it's always a pleasure to sit down and chat with you. Thank you so much for doing this. Happy Christmas and happy new year to you as well. And probably chat in 2024. Happy holidays. And that's all for our year in review episode for this 2023. We'd like to extend our heartfelt gratitude for all of those who have tuned in and watched. Your support means the world to us. Remember, our mission is to bring you the most important municipal stories from across Canada and around the world. And we can't do that without you. So please keep those stories coming. Share your municipal news, your concerns, and even your municipal triumphs with us. Your engagement is what fuels our passion for shedding light on the issues that truly matter in our communities. And your voices are essential to that mission. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking. Thank you.